Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We'll be exploring the African Brazilian religious traditions today, Candomblé and Umbanda. With me is Professor Stanley Krippner, who is the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University. Dr. Krippner is the author of over a thousand academic papers, including many papers on this subject. He is also co-author with Alberto Villaldo of a book on healing traditions called The Realms of Healing. Welcome, Stanley. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I should say, for the benefit of our viewers, that you are an honorary member of both Umbanda and Candomblé. Well, that's right, and this sort of gave me license to represent the African religions of Brazil at the World Congress of Religions, also called the World Parliament of Religions, that was held in Salt Lake City and some years before that actually in Australia. And on both occasions I was the only one at that entire Congress that represented the entire continent of South America. Well, here I am a white guy representing Latin American traditions, mainly uh, from people of color, but it's better than nothing. Yes, well, uh, these are important traditions in my mind, uh, especially uh, as they're practiced today in Brazil uh, for many reasons. Uh, let's start out with the fact that, uh, as I understand it, these are traditions that originally came from the Yoruba culture of Africa and uh, are practiced today in, a, in Brazil in a, a more pure form uh, than one can find generally in Africa today. This is the irony. The candomblé tradition in Brazil is actually closer to the indigenous traditions of the Yoruba in Western Africa mm -hmm. than is practiced in West Africa itself. Well, because of the Christian influx, the Muslim influx, which has sort of diluted the practice. And so I have been told by practitioners in Brazil that sometimes a priest will come from Africa to Brazil to get sort of a refresher course on what the tradition is really all about. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in, in some ways, these traditions uh, strike me as being polytheistic, like the ancient Greek yes. uh, and religion or the Hindu religion. And yet, they, uh, in moving to, to the Christian nation of Brazil, they began to cloak their religion because they were slaves in Brazil and were expected to practice Christianity. So they took the names of Christian saints and replaced the names of their deities with those names so that the slave masters thought they were practicing some variety of Christianity. You are so right. Imagine the slaves coming over to Brazil. It was mainly Brazil. That was the closest country to the closest continent to uh, Africa. Coming over in chains, crammed into a boat, it was not only the Yoruba, sometimes enemies of the Yoruba were crammed into the same boat, but they had to make peace to survive. And so the slaves, once they arrived, their families were split up, their freedom was split up, their culture was taken away from them. The only thing they had left was religion, and they didn't want to give that up. They were all baptized Roman Catholics, but the slaves did a very clever thing. They hung on to their tradition by, in secret, praying to the deities from Africa, but every once in a while a priest would come in and they would immediately shift into the Catholic deity that most closely resembled the deity in Africa. Now, it's intriguing to me that you said Catholic deity. I think you meant Catholic saint. 
uh, but the point... Yes, Catholic saints. The, the, right. the, it's an interesting point because the, with all of their saints and the ways in which Catholics uh, implore uh, their saints for help, it's not so different from a polytheistic religion. Not so different. This is what they found out. For example, in Africa, Iamanja, the goddess of the salt water, was a fairly minor deity. But that's the one that they prayed to to protect them coming across the Atlantic Ocean. And so when the priests came in and they were thanking Iamanja for their safe visit, they immediately shifted, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed be the fruit of thy womb, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the priests, oh, what good Catholics they've turned out to be. The astonishing thing is they got away with this. Mm -hmm. they For got centuries. A, yeah, they gave white masks to the dark faces. Mm -hmm. And once the slaves were freed, by the way, by a princess from Portugal, once Napoleon took over Portugal, the royalty came to Brazil, once the slaves were freed in about 1880-something, then Candomblé came into its own spread all around the country, not only under the name of Candomblé, other names as well. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it was the women who were in charge of many of the terreros or churches or worship centers, the main one being the White House, the Casa Branca in Salvador, Brazil. Mm -hmm. And I had the great privilege, as did you, of visiting my Menonide de Guantua, who is a direct descendant of the founders of that particular church, which was the first major candomblé uh, center of worship in Brazil once the slaves are freed. In Salvador, where, which is sort of the center of candomblé culture. Salvador is the center of, uh, that's right, absolutely mm -hmm. right. Now you mentioned that candomblé is known by many names, yes. and, and we've also talked about Umbanda, so, uh, can you distinguish between Candomblé and Umbanda? Yes. Once Candomblé became above board and people practiced it, a lot of middle class people were attracted to Candomblé. But they were a little bit too refined for all of the drumming and even the animal sacrifice, now not so common. And they wanted something, you know, a little bit more sophisticated. So in about the year 1900, they formed an offshoot of Candomblé called Umbanda. And that leaned a little more heavily on the uh, Christian saints. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, they're so similar that I have a friend, Pai A. Lee, in Recife, Brazil, who is a priest both of Candomblé and of Umbanda, and his temple, which attracts hundreds of people and has a congregation of thousands of people, some nights he has an Umbanda service, some nights he has a Candomblé service. And across the walls, there are statues of the African deities and on another wall of the Christian saints. Mm -hmm. And he bounces back and forth between the two as the occasion permits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Umbanda and Candomblé are both what I call spiritistic religions. Now, there's a third spiritistic religion, and that's Cardecismo, based on the writings of Allan Kardec, a French educator mm -hmm. who had nothing to do with Africa, but who was collecting stories of mediums and found out that the mediums in France had many things in common, and so he formed a doctrine called uh, spiritism, and that spread to Brazil because during the days of the empire, anything French was held in great esteem. Even the royalty spoke French, mm -hmm. and any book from France became prized possession. And that's how the third spiritistic religion, Cardicismo, or spiritism, came into being. What do they all have in common, all three in the minor offshoots? They're called spiritistic religions because they all believe in spirits that interact with human beings. Secondly, they all believe in reincarnation, that one can pass through several lifetimes as part of the uh, uh, cycle of life. Mm -hmm. And third, they all have a few of the allies in common. 
Cardosismu doesn't have the deities in common from Africa, but they do have archetypal images who pray to value the old black slaves, Ushkoboklos, mm-hmm. uh, the half-breed Indians, Ashkriansis, the little babies who died when they were very young. And those three are the those three archetypal categories are the ones that you pray to because they can intercede with the saints, the spirits, the Orishas, or with God. Now the Orishas are the African deities. Yes, Orishas are the African deities, and that word is still used primarily in Candomblé. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, the other feature, as I understand it, of all of these religions is is the role that mediumship, spiritualist mediumship, plays. Absolutely. When I said they all believe in spirits, an offshoot of that belief in spirits is that the mediums what do we call the Pai de Santos, the father of the spirits, the Mai de Santo, the mother of the spirits. Yes, the spirits can come in and be channeled by these very, very powerful mediums. And the mediums can give advice, hopefully good advice. They can do healings, hopefully valid healings. Mm-hmm. And so when you come to one of these services in all three of the spiritistic religions, be prepared to have mediums channel spirits from the other side, left and right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's fair to say that um, there's a larger context for all of this. And if we go back to, let's say, the 19th century, uh, the whole field of psychical research uh, originated in Europe as an effort to apply scientific methodology to the study of the spiritualists. That's right. Now, of course, that was independent of what happened in Brazil, Yes. but I'm glad you mentioned that because when I come across a new phenomenon, almost always it's connected to something in my youth. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, I was fascinated by Brazil. Why? During the Second World War, as part of U.S. foreign policy, the good neighbor policy did a lot to get Brazil on the Allied side. There mm-hmm. are a lot of fascists and Nazis in Brazil. Yeah. Those were sidelined, and Brazil became a U.S. ally, as did many other countries. Mm-hmm. And there were even movies that Walt Disney produced, notably The Three Caballeros, with a Jose Carioca from Brazil, and a Mexican rooster, and Donald Duck from the United States. <laughs> and I loved the music. I mm-hmm. loved the scenes from Brazil. Mm-hmm. And so I followed Brazil over the years. And then when I had a chance to give a talk at a conference in Brazil with Alberto Viola, who you mentioned before, I went right down there. We found a Umbanda session. It was in such a dangerous part of town, the taxi cab driver dropped us off a few blocks from the center. Mm-hmm. We walked in the darkness, and then we saw this house lit up by candles. Aha, that's Umbanda. We went in, we were royally received, we were given healings, we were allowed to take photographs, we were treated like honored guests, we were given snacks at the end of the service. It was beautiful, and then they put us on a safe bus back to our hotel. Mm -hmm. And good heavens, I've been to perhaps several dozen car deck, Umbanda, and Candomblé services, and I've written about them. That's how I became a honorary member of Umbanda and Candomblé. Mm -hmm. Because again, when I come across an unusual phenomenon, I think, how can this be researched? Yes. I did one research paper on how people are called to mediumship. Mm -hmm. And of course, one is an illness that is cured through mediumship. Another one is, you know, it's in the family. Another was simply by attending services and sort of being assimilated. Another one is a dream from the spirits or the Orishas or whatever. So there are many ways that people are called, and that article now is very, very widely cited. But then I did a larger study, thanks to my dear friend Pai A. Lee, who runs both the Candomblé and Umbanda in Recife, I got access to dozens of mediums. And then, thanks to my contacts in Curitiba, Brazil, dozens of more mediums, Mm -hmm. both Umbanda and Candomblé, and with some of my students, we put together the largest study ever done 
we got demographic data from both males and females, and their call to become a spiritist medium sometimes occurs at the age of four or five, sometimes in middle age, mm -hmm. with all ages in between. They're called in different ways. We recorded which type of Orisha, or which old black slave, which Kriansa kid, baby, mm -hmm. which uh, half-blood Indian, called them across the board. Some of them incorporate a dozen or more. Mm -hmm. Some of them have one that they incorporate. We also did something that's never been done before. The Kinsey scale developed by Albert Kinsey has a spectrum of homosexuality, heterosexuality. We gave that to the mediums because the mm -hmm. mediums make no big bones about their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the wonderful things about mediumship. Yeah, gays are very welcome. Why? Because they might have been the opposite gender in another life. Mm -hmm. So there's still a little carryover from the other life. We found absolutely no difference between the heterosexual mediums and the homosexual mediums or anything in between. No difference in terms of what? No difference, uh, most important. We gave everybody two psychological tests that have been translated into Portuguese, the dissociation scale and the absorption scale. Medium score very high on both scales. They dissociate easily mm -hmm. and they absorb easily. Mm -hmm. And the only difference in terms of this gender study, the more lesbian-oriented women were a little better educated than the other women. Not much, a little mm -hmm. bit. Otherwise, really, sexual orientation made no difference on any of the scales. One interesting thing, though, we always have control groups in a study like this. So we had an equal number of Brazilians who were not mediums. And yes, there were some differences, mm -hmm. but the average Brazilian from our study dissociates much more easily than the average American. I'm not surprised. But let's, for the benefit of our viewers who may not know how these technical terms are used, mm -hmm. define what dissociation and absorption mean to a professional psychologist. Absolutely. Dissociation means that there's a split between what you are aware of and what's going through your mind. Like I could be talking with you and then suddenly I might have an image of something that happened I mean, yesterday. You'd notice that my mind is wandering. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm dissociating. Mm -hmm. In severe cases, people dissociate to free themselves of a trauma. They have had abuse or a or bullying yes. or a war injury, mm -hmm. and they spend a lot of time thinking about other things or fantasizing. Mm -hmm. So dissociation is fairly common among people, but in extremes it can be pathological. Mm -hmm. Our mediums were not high enough to be pathological, but they were still more easily mm -hmm. dissociatable than the average Brazilian and the average Brazilian dissociated more than the average American. Because we use the term dissociative identity disorder. Is oh, those are multiple personalities. That's yeah. a whole different thing. And this is very important. I brought, th glad you brought that up. No, mediums do not suffer from dissociative identity disorder because they treat dissociative identity disorder and they have guidelines. Mm -hmm. They have guidelines from their point of view, and I've written about this, some DID, dissociative identity disorder, is a result of past lives coming mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Others is a result of trauma. Mm -hmm. And they claim that they can differentiate between the two because if it's a result of trauma, they need healing. They need the mm -hmm. poor psyche to be pieced together again. If it's past life, then they have a different type of integration. They resolve the issues from the past life and so that the psyche is a uh, more or less unitary psyche again. Now, what you're saying t is crucial to me because w what it suggests is that among the spiritist community in Brazil, uh, there has evolved a very sophisticated system of psychotherapeutics and the uh, theories around those psychotherapeutics that integrates what we in uh, North America would call transpersonal psychology, things like past lives and yes. spirit mm -hmm. possession. They integrate into a psychotherapeutic model and uh, have, as I understand it, many claims of success in this regard. 
they, they claim to have great success, and of course, there's always, at least as far as my experience is concerned, always a psychotherapist who works along with them. Psychotherapists, psychiatrists or psychologists, social workers with good credentials mm -hmm. who've been through the training, gotten their master's or their PhD or the equivalent, and they work right along with the mediums mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, the mediums don't go off the wall. And right. I think we also ought to mention for our viewers that although Brazil is nominally a Catholic country, that these spiritist religions mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, constitute um, close to a majority of the population. Yeah, the interesting thing is with the African Brazilian religions that have Roman Catholic saint counterparts, mm. They see no conflict going to Mass on Sunday, going to Candomblé on Wednesday. The problem is with the Pentecostals, the very conservative uh, Protestants. Mm -hmm. They think this is the work of the devil. They're more rigid than the Catholics. The Catholics say it was a law, as long as they, you know, pay some sort of uh, obedience or veneration mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ and Mary and the saints, can't be all bad. Well, the Pentecostals don't have any truck with the saints or with Mary. They're completely with Jesus, and they don't, yeah. uh, they're don't. not as pliable as the Catholics <laughs> in Brazil. Yeah. Um, back to the therapeutic uh, modalities, I think it's also important to note that in, in addition to the many successes claimed uh, for these therapies, there's a wide variety of paranormal phenomenon and paranormal claims that are associated with these traditions, and you have had the opportunity to observe some of that firsthand. You know, I have. Just for the record, I've never observed anything that doesn't have a more mainstream interpretation, mm -hmm. a psychological interpretation. Mm -hmm. Having said that, People like Luis Gasparetto, who is a clinical psychologist, yes. claims to channel famous artists yes. and has produced some very beautiful paintings in the style of Rembrandt, Picasso, uh, Van Gogh, etc. I've worked with him, and, and the interesting thing yes. is it takes him about two or three minutes to produce these. That's remarkable in and of itself. Yeah. You're right. And sometimes with both hands. And sometimes even with his feet. With his feet. Yeah. Now, that to me is just as impressive as channeling an artist, to uh -huh. tell you the truth. Yes. And, and there's also Chico Xavier, the medium of Brazil. Oh, my God. Chico Xavier. Uh, I regret that I never got to meet him. I almost did, but he was in poor health. Mm -hmm. He Now, this is important. He channeled a dozen different spirits... And he wrote, literally, a couple of hundred plays, essays, novels, poems. And there has been a recent study where they've taken one of his novels and compared the writing style to his writing style as Chico Xavier. Different. I mean, he didn't have a lot of education, no, as he I didn't. recall. And the stuff that he wrote is literate. Mm -hmm. It's been published in several languages. His plays have been produced. One has been made into a movie. Very, very articulate stuff. And how do you explain the two different writing styles? Mm -hmm. That's something he didn't know about when he was doing the channeling. I think Chico Xavier really needs mm -hmm. much more attention from parapsychologists than he has received. Another mm -hmm. so-called Chandler of the Kardec persuasion in Recife is Jacques Pierre. And he also channels paintings, and he agreed to let us do an encephalographic Jacques Andrade, pardon me, Jacques mm -hmm. Andrade, my mistake, Jacques Pierre is a Haitian artist, senior moment, uh, that's a whole other lecture, um, the Haitian voodoo. Not all that dissimilar from Candomblé. Mm -hmm. Both are having origins in Africa. Yes. Okay, Jacques Andrade let us attach electrodes to his head, as did Pai A. Lee, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, priest of Candomblé and Umbanda. Yes. And we had them imagine that they were uh, channeling spirits of one sort or another, and the results were quite remarkable. 
the psychophysiology changed from the baseline rate. We also had to control Brazilian, knowing how Brazilians are prone to dissociation. Yes. No, the control Brazilian showed none of that. Mm -hmm. This is the first psychophysiological study of fairly prominent people from Cardicismo, Candomblé, and Umbanda. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is when they incorporate, uh, or supposedly incorporate, the spirit of mm -hmm. uh, an archetypal entity or a deceased person, yes, their physiology changes. The physiology changes, at least in our, in our study. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And so this argues against this being fake that this is, you know, a good job of acting. Yeah. I'm sure with some mediums it is, but with these, shall we say, elite mediums who we checked into, mm -hmm. yeah, the physiology was quite remarkably different. Mm -hmm. Well, we could go on for a long time about the uh, relationship between the practitioners and the uh, archetypal energies with which they work. I know uh, uh, you have been given yourself an, an archetypal uh, parent. Yes. Uh, but our time Oshala, is, the oh, god of purity. Oshala is yes. your spiritual father. Yes, the god of intelligence. I'm very honored. Yes. Mm -hmm. Stanley Krippner, our time is up once again. Thank you so much for sharing with me. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.